Good right. morning to everyone. Thank you for coming. I think that uh, Ross doesn't really need any introduction. Everyone knows uh, your work pretty well. But I think that uh, it would be interesting to start uh, really from uh, the beginning. And uh, because uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about organic design. So I think that looking at uh, your work, uh, uh, organic design reflects the form, uh, but not only, and especially it reflects uh, the inner structural system of nature and uh, exactly what make it work. So it's not about the shape, but it's about uh, the organization that produce those shapes. So what is organic design for you? And uh, when did it start? <clears throat> well, you know, you're here today and this might just be another talk for you, I don't know, but it's not another talk for me. It's a big talk. Even though it's not a big audience, it's a very, very important subject, certainly for myself. So, I just want to stress the importance to me today of talking with Amelia about a subject which is my core subject. I've sort of avoided talking about it directly. I give lectures which are called For the Love of Form or Finding Form. But that's more of a provocation. I think the question from Amelia is very sound because the misconception of design, uh, organic design, is that it's just a kind of funny shape. <laughs> and just to, before I go beyond that, there are two types of organic form. There's graphic organic, and I would say the work of Mark, Mark Newson, is very graphic organic. I would say Alvare Alto is graphic organic. Uh, but organic organic is another story. And for example, my friend Karim Rashid, Karim does graphic organic. He doesn't make organic organic. And organic design is incredibly sophisticated. We are organic design. <laughs> and before we go a little bit further on that, um, I've got to get something off my chest because there's an assumption that design which is straight line, radius, straight line, is modest. And form expression is not. It's superfluous, it's show off, uh, and it's immodest. It's not that. And I've got some examples here today in my slide collection uh, that will, will confirm that. I'm trying to champion uh, the, the, the genesis depth of why we create form. And again, um, when we start with the imagery, uh, you'll get a sense of that. Maybe we can just pop something yeah, up. Yeah, because I think that what is really interesting is that uh, it's not a question of copying nature, but it's the question of being inspired by nature, but also being inspired through a very deep observation, intuition, and understanding of nature. Mm -hmm. People come to my studio and they see my DNA staircase. And because it's got the name DNA, they automatically, that triggers a reaction that it's based on DNA. You know, the Crick and uh, Watson discovery. Or skeletons, because I actually have bones in my studio. Um, that's completely wrong. Uh, the, if you look at the history of, uh, evolutionary his history of form, and structure, and this is a very weird thing I'm about to say, but if you, you know, designers, uh, dinosaurs uh, existed 250 million years. A shark is older than that. Uh, when you have a slow evolutionary development that uh, anticipates and reacts to atmospheric change, earth change, that's what design is. It's just that today it's very quick, and in the very deep past it was very, very slow. Glaciers move uh, uh, in, in perceptible speed, whereas today I could say to somebody, give me a one millimeter thick television, and in one year it's there. There's, two, there's three levels of evolution at the moment. The first is primary evolution, which, is, which moves at glacial speed. 
secondary evolution kicked off with the Industrial Revolution, where man stepped in and said, look, we have needs and we, we can make things at, a, at an industrial level, <coughs> which Stone Age, Bronze, Copper Age, and then into the Industrial Revolution. And I'll talk about that again uh, through imagery. Uh, but then tertiary evolution, which is the stage we're at now, that's third phase evolution, is edging towards singularity. The moment when <coughs> humans, uh, this is what Ray Kurzweil talks about, he says that there's a moment when humans, maybe within by 2060, 2080, have so much knowledge of the world that they become nature themselves. And that means designing and making at a nano level, and an atomic level, which is sort of the end of my talk. Um, <coughs> But when you look at the evolution, of, you know, what nature does is it drills holes in things. It removes extraneous material. And I gave a talk uh, to, with the car, in, the car industry uh, yesterday about green car design. I saw my friend sneak in. Hi. Uh, <coughs> uh, and I tried to allude to this. I never got enough time to talk about it. It's really a book. But the idea that, you know, when you see my chair for Moroso, it has holes in it. That's not because I like holes, that's because you don't need the material. So there's another dimension that satisfies me in my... Yeah, this yeah. is something that uh, I, I, I think is extremely interesting, this idea that natural drills holes and just take away. Hmm. And uh, it's really to get to what is really necessary and looking into nature, how good is nature in doing it. But what is really interesting is how you are able to apply, in a way, this kind of natural process to design. And this is the interesting link. Well, the thing that's missing today, and this is not a criticism of designers at all, uh, is um, in all this biodiversity that we're experiencing, <coughs> I don't see enough instinct. I very rarely meet people with true instinct. Instinct is pre-linguistic, and what you do with that, if you bring that up to date, remember that design is a global profession, it has global impact. Um, it means if you want to sell something all over the world, you have to be almost pre-linguistic. You, you, you use emotional, sensorial, polysensorial virtues, the eyes first and then everything else that comes with that to attract people, but I like attraction through intelligence. <laughs> I, strangeness is a consequence of innovative thinking. And I'm naturally attracted to strangeness because strangeness means something, somebody thought about it or nature th created it in a way where it only reacted to condition without the constraints of marketing or good taste. Not bad, is it? And uh, in the word or misconception i think that this is uh, a great image uh, because uh, very few people will define it a piece of design yeah if you come if you come to my studio which we, we do um what i often do is i will place uh, a primitive tool a stone silex in the hand of somebody might be a cameraman actually uh and i and it, i'm telling you it puts some electrical charge through you you can't explain this particular one that I have is 250,000 years old. And next to it, I have my cameras and my other objects. And when I take my iPhone out and put it in the hand, it doesn't do anything for me. That's not because the iPhone needs to be a funny shape at all. It's just that one is a kind of utilitarian universal tool, and the other one, the person who owned it made it. Up until about 1750 or a little bit earlier, most people made their own stuff. <laughs> you know, families, everybody in the family had to be capable of craft. And in the deep past, I mean, 20,000 plus years ago, when people only had organic materials, uh, you want to see what they made. Bow and arrows made from maybe 16 different materials from a radius of 100 kilometers that worked perfectly. And they made it lightweight. Why? Because they had no oil, they had no car cars. Everybody had to carry everything. And here we are today, and we work below our potential, big time. Because lightness, for example, is a really important thing in society because lightness is a sense of economics. And with contemporary digital computational design, parametric design, you can drill as many holes in things as you can. 
and also the process of 3D printing and everything that backs that up, which is what is alluding to the way of future of new industry, we will see a radical change of intelligence because we're going through a terrible mid-phase of lack of intelligence, in my view. This is an incredibly intelligent object. Yeah, in terms of lightness, I think that we have lost a little bit uh, the idea that lightness is important mm -hmm. because uh, we are lazy in a way and uh, we don't have to carry things. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is always something or someone uh, that uh, yeah. help us out. Uh, so the concept of lightness has become a little bit too aesthetic in a way instead of functional. And I think we have to re-approach. Well, for example, when I sit in on, on juries at the Angavanta in Vienna with Greg Lynn and Zaha and the great you know, architects of today, the parametric architects of today, um, <clears throat> we talk about projects where we say architecture in space, where you don't have any gravity and things can grow and be how they want. But actually, architecture in the oceans is exactly the same because you're not dealing with the same forces of gravity. So things can grow in whichever way they want. Again, strangeness is a consequence of innovative thinking. Before, <coughs> sorry, my voice is going. I've been talking all week. This, um, we go from the silex to this. This is work of my studio. This is um, directional flapping, uh, napping and mapping of surface skins because we tried to develop a program that would, in a modern process, high temp. Uh, in a modern process, uh, can facilitate and copy the act of making a flint in the old days. And by the way, when you make a, a stone tool, you don't chip it, you press against it and it flakes off. We did this on the computer. Look at these things. And the reason we did this was because of this. These are all the computational studies of my studio to arrive somewhere in this vicinity here because this is a perfume bottle for Kenzo. Right? Separated by 250,000 years. So, uh, but you could have, I could have just sprayed the, the old one silver and maybe saved myself a lot of time. <clears throat> yeah, you could have, but <laughs> <laughs> it's the process that is yeah. in between that is then the yeah. interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. Going from that first pieces to yeah. the one that you have created, yeah, exactly. it's the interesting exactly. path. This is the work I do do, and deep, the, the underlying core, the, 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 the absolute heart of an idea is, comes when you have technology shift. When you have technology shift, that's a paradigm shift, and a paradigm shift means new aesthetics. This is a camera, and if you look at the history of the camera, in the, in the 20s, cameras were made, 1910, 1920, this is approximately 100 years after conception, they were made from wood, paper, bit of leather, bit of metal, uh, the old box cameras. But by the way, everything in those days is made that way. Planes, cars, tables, art. It was all made the same way. And today it's completely different. But we've gone from uh, basically Stone Age, Bronze Age, into the Industrial Revolution, uh, Revolution and now we are moving into into the 50s, it sort of became the metal age, this is post-war, and now we're in the composite polymer age. We're going, whoa, into another world of materials. The second camera I designed, I did in 1982 at the Royal College of Art, and this is from 1990, it's called the Eye, and I designed it for Olympus in Japan. It was when the film disappeared. And when the film disappeared, I designed that. You can drop it in the bathtub. Uh, you wouldn't want to do that with your iPhone. So there's not been any progress in that almost 23 years since I did this. Uh, and I'm astonished. I still get people when they come to the studio wanting one of these. So you, you want timeless design? Just Absolutely. think kind of at the heart of the idea. And I can show some examples too. Yeah, I actually think that in terms of uh, everyone is talking about sustainability and then they produce and produce and produce every year you have to have a new product. Why the most interesting thing in sustainability is to have a product that lasts. Well, that's a marketing idea, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, um, this is great. You know, I mean, if there are industrial designers here, you probably love this stuff because it's a bit nerdy. But, you know, this is from uh, uh, the collection in London. Um, okay, anyway. But uh, I don't often go to uh, the, um, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. 
uh, to look at the armor. And last time I was there, I was with Ronan Burelek, showing him my favorite pieces and my favorite jades in that museum. So it's not only me that's kind of a bit odd on the subject, but this, you see a piece of 16th century armor here that's fashioned by hand. They had rags with sand trying to get that steel into that shape. But <clears throat> what's interesting here is that the ribbing here is for reinforcement. You know, that's not, it's decoration, but it's embedded decorations because this is jousting armor. The shape that you have, I don't know if there's a laser on this, the shape that you have on the, on the helmet itself, when you can't even see how you get the helmet on, uh, is for the jousting uh, rod to deflect. So all this design here is purposeful. It's amazing. You know, and also on top of that, not having any tools to build it. I think it's in, what we have today is so remarkable and we don't produce good enough things considering the knowledge and the, the processes that we have. So, you know, bring it right up to date. This is a machine tool for my water bottle. I think the water bottle's okay, but actually I prefer the tool and I've always said if I ever make any money, I'll make myself a tool, <laughs> which is a little bit silly. But, you know, it's just if you look at this form, this form is derived from, this was, the water bottle was the first digitally generated consumer product. And I did it in the year 2000. Uh, and it's based on algorithms. And actually Tim Williams is here today. I worked with Tim on that. And um, Tim was working uh, for a company in Wales and we went there to scan my models. And uh, Tim was so good I hired him. And um, a job that I could have taken, we, we did an experiment in the studio, uh, how quickly we could design a water bottle. Because uh, it's for Teen Ant, and Teen Ant is blue normally. So we ran a competition in the studio and Go, Go, Gernot Oberfell <coughs> won by designing a bottle in eight minutes. He did it rotational, kind of bubbly shape, uh, and he did it blue. I could have earned the same money for eight minutes work and said to my client, I'm a kind of guru, this is what the world needs, it's blue, water's blue. But actually water's not blue, it's transparent. And if you make a bottle blue, you can't recycle it. I mean, this is a story and a half, so that's, you have to get me away from this because I could talk. And the water day. is not still. That's no, and the beauty of the bottle is that uh, it, 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 it promotes an idea which is called mass individualism because when you pick up the, this is what organic design is about. It's a trinity moment. It's a sort of eureka moment when you realize that what you've done is by the tessellated skin, you can use thinner polymer, less material, its structure, like the armor. Uh, <clears throat> somebody with arthritis or a young child or anybody infirm can hold that bottle. It's beautiful to hold. Um, on top of that, the optical beauty of the object is just astonishing. When, it, when there's no water in it, it feels throwaway, which is correct. But when you put water in it, it's like water itself. And when you pour from the bottle, when the layer of the water comes down, no two shapes are ever the same for anybody. So if you've got observational skills, when you're pouring the water, the shape of the top is incredible. My mum and dad had the first two, and uh, they still fill them up because they can't throw them away, these things. So there's a, everything is essential. Henry Moore would always talk about the love in creating form. Form creates love. It's emotional. It's, it's, a, it's a sensual form of giving. Yeah, and it's also interesting that it's uh, now through the new technology, the new material that mm -hmm. we can get to this kind of design. Yeah. That it was impossible before, but now that we have yeah. all these tools, yeah. we should use it to get to this result, not well, to... Yeah, well, you know, this is a piece of art. It's, uh, it's the a libreria, it's a shelving system, and it's completely holistic. It's machined from pieces and put together. Normally I make these things out of one block and when I use the milling process I can use only the material I need. In the beginning, well, this is a bit grand, Bernini, he had somebody with a drill, a famous man with a drill, and he made amazing pieces, you know, uh, because they could drill into the marble and make three-dimensional work. Uh, then Rodin worked with clay 
Henry Moore worked with all of those processes. And, and the day that they discovered polystyrene, his work changed. His scale went up. In fact, his assistants made a block, of, took a block of polystyrene in the 50s, made it into a rock, and they painted it. And they pretended to throw it at him on his bicycle, and he jumped off his bicycle, and it bounced all over the place. And then his work grew. Um, so I think process is everything. And even Francis Bacon always used to say, if you want to do something new, you need a new process. So this is a new process of milling, because I'm in the 21st century, and that's what I want to do. But if you relate it to those three slides, but that cost me £100,000 to make. That's where I spend my money. I don't have a big fancy car. I don't have, you know, I have nice things. But that's where I spend my money confirming my ideas. And I couldn't get a manufacturer to make that for love nor money, because it's too expensive. Patrizia Urquiola said something lovely last year in, in Milan. She said, my limited editions are all the rejects from my design life because they're the things you can't make. So I thought it was kind of interesting uh, comment. Well, you know, we're, none of us are supposed to be jealous, but isn't that amazing? I mean, that's incredible. It's great. Well, you know. And it's also interesting that uh, um, you really are interested and you take your inspiration for art, architecture, and uh, it's. Uh, it's the new way of working. It's really looking at things that have a different scale, but the same purpose and the same uh, achievement. When Anish wanted to <coughs> confirm some of his work, he went to work with Cecil Balmond. When he did Marseilles at, uh, at the Tate, at the Turban Hall, it was Cecil Balmond, the great structural engineer, who did that. Uh, he used to work with Jan Kaplitsky, the late Jan from Future Systems, we miss him, but Jan used to work with Anish in making train stations and forms. So the actual idea of collaboration is very important, but underlying that is the fact that for me today, design doesn't have a process. It's ridiculous. The educational system of teaching students, I mean, I don't want to get shot here, but it's ridiculous. And if you go into the field of architecture, AA, Bartlett, Angervante, Zurich, they're taught actually not to reach a conclusion. They're not saying, oh, there's a hairdryer or oh, it's ridiculous. They, they, they go in deep into their process and then maybe the process will become something. And Zaha today, you can't criticize Zaha because she's building. Two weeks ago, I was in Montpellier looking at her building. It's incredible for somebody like me. I might, I can't, my body changes shape because it moves me so much. So you can't criticize that anymore. And there's such a flow of inertia in the field of architecture and students now to go for this. It's incredible. But what I want to do is I want to make it intelligent. And I'd like to be the one, and it sounds grand, but I want to be the one on a parallel that brings that over into design. I'd like to initiate a shift, but you can't initiate a shift if you don't know your history and your evolutionary sensibility. I yeah, design, it seems he has a lot to catch up yeah. in relation to what's happening yeah. in architecture. Yeah, right. The, the talk was called Rewind, Pause, Fast Forward, and when I was putting the images together with Emily, I said, oh, bugger it, let's mix it all up. Uh, this is a bouclier, a shield, it's woven and it's made from grass and I have a huge collection of shields uh, because it's just it's such a body related object and the lightness the the function of the object that subtlety of shape it could be Japanese it's not it's just by the beside the Congo this one but <clears throat> I look at these things and they really really move me yet we're talking now about yeah. parametric design and they're also very interesting because they have this uh, function to protect Yes. that uh, is uh, extremely important and it can't fail. I'm working with my assistant Nori, my Japanese assistant Nori, on what we call anatomical informants. Anatomical informants. So there we're working on coat hangers and anything I could do with Nori, I could do a door handle, I can, I'm doing headphones, I'm doing coat hangers, I'm doing things which are sort of body related because uh, he's Japanese and he has a great sensibility so you know what I do is I come it was his birthday yesterday and I gave him a, a headrest a fantastic old headrest 
Uh, you know, because you know that's not an insult to a designer anymore. That's such a beautiful thing. So I don't have a problem coexisting with these things because that's my suitcase for Globetrotter, and it's made from triaxial carbon by Terei in Japan. And for me, it's the same. Would you say? I mean, if you go from the woven aspect and lightness to woven and lightness, separated by about 180 years. How much does your weight? 1.35 kilos. It's the lightest suitcase on earth. Yeah, I think set, this, yeah, good. this you is set me up for no, that. No, it's very you? interesting because uh, I think that uh, in the world of suitcase, I don't know if you uh, you buy this suitcase uh, and uh, they need to have wheels because they are heavy, not because you are taking with you a lot of things. They have to need they need wheels because the object in itself is heavy. And how crazy is it? Well, wheels are pretty useful, but especially the ones with four. But we deliberately did the suitcase without wheels to promote the idea of carriage. It comes back to what I was saying earlier. And um, <clears throat> when we did this, uh, uh, it was, again, it sounds grand, but it was an act of humanity. I mean, I fly all the time, and there's people with, the, you know, when the trolley comes around with the whiskey and the absolute vodka, you know, duty-free, I'm thinking, you know, I'm on my way to... You know, somewhere long distance. You know how much it costs the planet to fly a bottle of whiskey to Australia? Probably about half as much in fuel. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So weight is a consequence to the planet. And, uh, you know, because it's an energy-related thing and our energy source is oil at the moment. And it's all very, very connected, you know. I mean, as an industrial designer, you have incredible responsibilities. It's not just about shape. It's about social ideologies, the history of the world, it's uh, where are we going to go with resources. If your cabin baggage allowance is eight kilos and you have a bag that weighs six kilos, you can only carry two kilos of clothes. It doesn't make any sense. And I've been barking on for a while that I'd love somebody to come and invest in me to, to run a project, uh, to start a brand called Love Grove Lightweight. So I'd be sitting here in lightest silk clothes, the lightest trainers. I buy, when I'm traveling, I buy all light stuff and I keep it, and I keep it in boxes and stuff. Because eventually one day I'm going to do the lightest clothes in the world and have the lightest suitcase and the thinnest toothbrush or a thing on your, a pad on your finger or no, or something you swill around your mouth. I don't know what you do, but to eliminate stuff. Um, and, you know, when you look at this object, when I've designed cases for a long time with Louis Vuitton, Hermes and all that in the past. And um, all this is, you can't make anything but a box because you can't be prescriptive with form. So this is, looks like you just blew air into it. And it's a pressurized object, like a spaceship. It feels kind of pressurized or a deep sea thing. You can feel its resistance. And uh, even the handle is the opposite of handles because when you have a handle that's an arc like a child would draw it squeezes your fingers so it's uncomfortable this one opens your fingers and it it bounces when you and it only takes its shape through weight nobody knows that but you know the, yeah but the when you try yeah and you realize yeah, it yeah i mean the, the the worst thing about this is the locks because they're standard locks and they weigh as much as the suitcase themselves because the company didn't have the money to do their own locks that so will be next step a zip <laughs> Well, I could talk all day. But, uh, yeah, but you can see some kind of relationships going on there. Um, this is one of my recent projects for Artemide. You know the yeah. work I've been doing with them, which is trying to lift them from their particular analog way to a digital. You've seen a lot of that work, I think. I tried to bring them in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, they came to me. And when somebody comes to you, it gives you a little bit more power to do what you want to do. If you go to them, it's not so easy. And uh, they have lovely workshops in uh, Pragnana outside Milan, but it's all screws. It smells like oil. It's like any kind of uh, workshop you go to. There's a bit of banging going on. There's a hole punch. And, a <sighs> and uh, so we've been working now maybe five or six years. And um, what we did about three years ago, we managed to get them to buy a five-axis milling machine, which is what we, we use um, or we, we promote in the work. So 
out of that came all my cosmic angel and cosmic uh, um, leaf series, which is these very digital dichroic things. And you want to see the faces of the people in the workshop because when this thing is thermoformed and they pick it up, they are in awe of this object, which is only like food packaging. It's super thin, it's a thermoforming, costs nothing, and you spray it silver. Okay? But out of that, you've got this object, which I don't know if I've got any images in here, but out of these come these objects. This is, um, when I work with Christoph on this, uh, it's great because we sit on the computer, and because it's um, parametric, you've got one c computer screen with all the numbers and the mathematics on them. It doesn't look like anything, and you shift and you move, and then you, the other thing pops up on a grid, and then we freeze it. So we're sculpting. And this one is uh, looking at vortexes, and it's side lit, so it means that when the light is off, you don't really see anything, it's when the light is on. That's new, never been done before. And in all the work that we've done with Gismondi now over that time, we've lifted the company 18.6% through a recession, through innovation. And that's Zaha's Soho China project in Beijing. And that is exists. It will yeah, exist. exists. It does exist. It do, that's a model, but it does yeah. exist. And I've been there, and it's incredible. And I talked to the engineer about how he makes the bridges because the, you can't make a single flat surface bridge because you've got no structure, so it's got to have form. But when the form doesn't meet form, what do you do with the form? That's really great design because you've created form through layering. That's plywood with windows in it. It's fantastic, and it exists. as does that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I've been to the other one, but I haven't been to that. And uh, that's in Mali. Mali. And now they're destroying their temples through terrible religious conflict. I mean, I had this thought, I'd go there and defend them because they, these are some of the greatest things on earth, made by hand. And the main mosque here in um, Timbuktu, every year the village stops because the dust blows off the surface of the building and forms a heap of mud at the bottom, like dust. Yeah, I think that this is it's a great example of also how we can look at nature and how nature adapt, transform and grow, yeah. and how this can be brought into design and architecture. So it's not more about a static. No. It's, it's really about the transformation. Well, this is made by hand, by people rubbing and it has a human scale because they made it by hand, not on the computer. And uh, <clears throat> for me, what really moves me deeply is that, in a sense, it's, you know, termite hills are made the same way. I mean, it takes us back to very deep origins with our other species on the planet. And some of these people are the most clean, dignified, elegant, beautiful people you could ever meet. They're incredible people. And they virtually have nothing. They wear color, they celebrate life. And these people generally live outdoors because it's so hot. So there's this thing where they, they, you know, they go to bed early and they come out early and they move with uh, nature, but also the sea, not the seasons, but they, they move with the climate too. So it's very synergistic. And today, if we work with solar energy and so on, and you, if you went there and put solar panels onto that thing embedded, phew, whoa, it's incredible. It'd be like, you know, uh, Star Wars or something. You know, and then other work I do, this is for Chicotti. Uh, you, you know, we published in our, our book. In our book, yeah. Yeah, and this is the fusion of carbon fiber with wood. with wood. And this is what I do in reaction to, you know, we were talking this morning about working in wood and I'd love to work more in wood, uh, but I'd like to do it in a modern way. Um, this is modern in the sense that it's looking for minimal structure and this is a photo shoot I did with Gabrielle and when I look at this on my computer screen I zoom it right in and I look at her shoulder blades in relationship to the back and when I was with Hans Wegner, Hans Wegner, the great, the king of the chairs before he died he told me that you don't need a chair that goes above your lumbar because your body needs to flex in order to exercise itself he was the king of the chairs so you don't really forget these things, and you, you pool it all. What I'm, when I'm talking to you, Amelia, I'm pooling everything. It's like a neural network of everything you know, and then it comes together, and then if you feel it fits, it becomes. 
It's like uh, Senor Pininfarina, who just died. He always said, if it looks right, it probably works. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like that. Carlo Molino. And, uh, you know, great organic designer. Uh, never actually designed for a company. The, all his furniture was designed for projects. And anatomically informed perfectly. And there are photos where you do see the women naked sitting on them. And actually, it's very sensual. There's nothing perverted about that. It's actually, you can see the body relationship. Yeah, I think that this is also something that has to do with being essential. So it's this organic essentialism that uh, it's very, very important. And it's about, uh, instead of adding things, really subtracting to get to the pure abstraction, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, isn't that wonderful? And I mean, if I was allowed to, because I, <clears throat> I try not to plagiarize, and I'll talk about that too. Um, but if I was allowed to, in the form of lineage, to go and look at that chair for real and say, ooh, could I make it in Kevlar and chain, you know, hollow, oof. If I was allowed to, without people criticizing me from stealing somebody's idea or something like that, you've got to be very open about these things. And uh, I would love to do projects like that. I'd like to follow the heritage of George Nakashima and mix carbon with wood. I've been to his workshop in Nakam Takamatsu Island in Japan. I've done all those things. And I have these feelings and I'm loaded up with projects which just are a question of living long enough to try and do them or, or find time uh, uh, outside of my normal work to engage. Now, <clears throat> this is the Panton chair. Would we, do we know our history? This is pan it's not the Panton chair. <laughs> uh, it was made about four years, I think, before. Um, and <clears throat> because this was waiting to happen, the technology just didn't exist. Okay, you know, uh, <clears throat> the idea of creating a, what I call single surface deformation, one surface that allows you to hold form. That's why chairs are so important as a prime statement, because they allow us to test engineering principles and weight and, you know, and anatomy. And all the great modernists, all the Eames, Nelson, Laverne, Saarinen, Jacobson, they worked to in anatomical information. And that's why the chairs are still selling. So that's the original, <clears throat> and that's Werner's. But actually, this is the, uh, the Vitra product, which is made in injection molded yeah. polymer, and it's got ribs behind it. I've been looking how to do that Define. with a pure sheet of carbon, and everything I do looks like Werner's chairs. So I can't show it to anybody. So we've got these bloody models in the studio, and we think, well, if I go to anybody with that, they think I've copied Werner, but I didn't because that's what you get. But y if you can move into a new technology, maybe you can move it a bit more, lose more surface, make it thinner so it stacks easier and so on. Raymond Loy, uh, the, the king of it all at the beginning. And um, this is next to one of his trains. In the inception of the Industrial Revolution, just after when he designed the Gestetner printer and so on, this was when industry got hold of form. This is another field in which you are very interested too, is the transportation. Oh, yeah. It's uh, something that uh, uh, I think also maybe because uh, it's not very good design in transportation at the moment. Well, it can look like that. <coughs> <coughs> this so. is a magnetic levitation train. I won the, the uh, Lotus Prize in China for my magnetic, solar-assisted magnetic levitation train. It's all in Chinese, I can't read it, but I thought that was great. <clears throat> this could be in the future where we go from, say, Paris to Beijing in seven or eight hours. That's another kind of lecture. But this is what happens when, you know, you've got Raymond there looking very dapper and suave. He used to hang out with presidents. He had an amazing house in Palm Springs. He was the first industrial designer to be lauded as somebody on their level. And that was a long time ago now. And I met him. I had the pleasure of meeting him. Um, and then uh, what we can do today. But this is Bucky's uh, Dymaxion car. This is so a great, 
And also, it's a very unfortunate product, actually, because uh, there were uh, there were probably five were manufactured, and then uh, uh, the production stopped because uh, there was an accident. And then they found out that it has nothing to do with the car. The accident. It was someone else who just yeah. So <coughs> and this great. Uh, uh, project uh, yeah. ended. It was uh, uh, 11 people carrier yeah. on a three wheels. It's amazing. Isn't that amazing? I don't know. I mean, there is a very interesting <coughs> video about uh, this uh, this car in which uh, they turn around the policeman <laughs> to show that actually the mobility was uh, incredible. Well, this is. He was an anticipatory something scientist. He called himself. So when I get interviewed and people say, are you a designer, which I'm tired of, five minutes, gosh, five minutes, <laughs> I say I'm an evolutionary biologist because I'm just sick and tired of being called a designer. So they, let's go quickly. This is a model made by Izumo Noguchi in plaster. You've got one of the world's greatest thinkers uh, in, a, in a global sense, but Richard Buckminster Fuller living and working with one of the world's greatest ever sculptors. Is a Monoguchi. I've, I've laid on his tatami mat in his samurai house in the south of Japan. I've tried to suck in his emotion in his work because it's incredible. But sometimes quietly when I'm sort of thinking on my own, I think I'd love to be between the two. I would have been the glue between these people because one's the kind of more scientific sculpting. thing and the other one is sculpting. And this is a video. Uh, this is a project I'm going to be showing in Cortricht in interior at the Biennale on the 20th of October. Uh, I work with Loi Vermeesh in Torino and this is a really important thing for me, even if we end here, this is really important because this is absolutely contemporary work and I said, right, I want to design a shape of a car and I want to run it through wind tunnel tests, uh, uh, digital wind tunnel tests in Torino, we found people who work with NASA, they do all the space shuttle aerodynamic tests, and they, we gave them some forms. And then they ran it through their system and they said, no, the form needs to look like this. I said, I don't agree. It doesn't look right to me. I said, we're doing it like this. And that's that. And then we ran it through, and the aerodynamic drag coefficients of this is fantastic. Of course, it doesn't have wheels, so it's a bit easier. But we're showing this is a form which can go either one way or the other. And it has this projection by BioThing, which um, replicates the aerodynamic movement. So it's between art, design, science, and so on. So if you want to come to Cortricht and see it, it could be fun. <laughs>